What if there was a single place that you could go to find out everything you needed to know about hyperbaric oxygen? For so many people, they are looking all over the internet, talking to different practitioners, trying to piece together the information that they need or want in order to actually move forward as a patient to get the treatment or to move forward as a practitioner to offer this therapy. Imagine that two people took 40 years of combined experience and put all of the information that they had in one particular place. That's what we're gonna talk about in today's video. If you don't already know, I've been teaching hyperbaric medicine, certifying technicians and practitioners in hyperbaric medicine for a number of years. My real reason that I started teaching hyperbaric medicine was because my own journey to learn all of the things I was looking for as a practitioner was a very long and winding road. My goal in teaching the course was to condense everything that I accumulated over almost 20 years in practice into a training class that somebody could take over the course of a few days. Quite honestly, I've been overwhelmed by the positive feedback that we've gotten and how many people we've been able to train in just a few years. Realizing how important the content is and that not everybody's going to be able to make it to one of our classes, Dr. Joe Dottori and I decided to put all of this information into a single place. In fall of 2024, Dr. Dottori and I released The Art and Science of Hyperbaric Medicine. It's a textbook that goes right along with the courses that we teach and provides all of the information I believe necessary to have a full understanding of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Where did it come from? How does this tool work? How do we discuss hyperbaric both to patients and to practitioners? What are the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric? How do we know what they are? And how do we create protocols that stimulate very specific pathways? What are the protocols for so many of the different uses that most of us are applying hyperbaric for? And of course, how do we build and maintain a safe and effective clinic? If you've taken one of our courses, I'm confident that you left that class with an incredible amount of knowledge and confidence that you did not come to the class with. And as a great reminder of the content of that class, you should have a copy of the art and science of hyperbaric medicine. If you've not yet gotten to a class, but you plan to in the future, whether it's our courses or somebody else's, but you're wanting to learn more and have all of this information in one place, you should absolutely get yourself a copy of this book. It is designed not as a textbook to sit on your desk and reference once in a while. This was a textbook that was actually designed to read cover to cover. And I promise you, if you do that, the amount of knowledge you will gain in that time would have been well worth it. The textbook is only offered through the publisher. So to get yourself a copy of this book, click the link over here, order the textbook, read it cover to cover, and then I want you to comment below or email me of what impact that had on your practice. Here are a few examples of the concepts covered in the art and science of hyperbaric medicine. With regard to anaerobic infections, this is a no-brainer. We've been using hyperbaric oxygen, even in traditional medicine, in traditional hyperbarics, for anaerobic infections for over 70 years. This includes infections like gas gangrene, necrotizing fasciitis, cerebral abscesses, and recurrent osteomyelitis. So between the active shifting of the oxygen environment and the killing of the infection, along with the supporting aspects of improving immune function, blocking toxins, and reducing inflammation, hyperbaric oxygen has been used very successfully for anaerobic infections. However, it's really only been utilized in traditional hyperbarics and for very severe, often either life-threatening or limb-threatening conditions. In those life-threatening and limb-threatening conditions, we're using very high, very aggressive pressures of oxygen and protocols. So two and a half atmospheres on 100% oxygen, sometimes two or three times a day for the first week or two. And we need to use very high pressures of oxygen and very aggressive protocols because these are very severe cases. Now, while there's much less research, in some cases, maybe not even any research to support using hyperbaric oxygen, for other anaerobic infections, that doesn't mean it would be ineffective. In other words, if hyperbaric works from a mechanistic view on anaerobic infections that are this severe, wouldn't it also be reasonable to understand that hyperbaric oxygen would help other anaerobic infections? Not because it's the treatment for that disease, but because those are the same mechanisms of action that would be used in any case. And so these less severe, more chronic infections like Lyme or certain mold species or C. diff or H. pylori, these other very common, also severe, but more chronic in nature rather than life-threatening and limb-threatening, just devastating to our quality of life. But hyperbaric can also have those same mechanisms of suppressing the infection, suppressing the growth, creating an environment that's not conducive for that bacteria to thrive, 
while also improving immune system function, reducing swelling and inflammation, and also reducing the toxins that these bacteria species are releasing into our bodies. Now, from a protocol standpoint, we're using very aggressive protocols for these very severe conditions. It's also, in my opinion, likely that we can use a much broader range of therapeutic hyperbaric pressures of oxygen and frequencies and duration for these less severe and more chronic issues. Rather than two and a half atmospheres, two or three times a day for two or three weeks, maybe we ought to use 1.3 or 1.5 or 1.75 atmospheres on enriched oxygen. But instead of three times a day, maybe it's only once or twice a day in some cases, maybe literally only once a day, maybe only three or four days a week instead of seven days a week. I believe that it should be our goal to learn how to apply hyperbaric differently and how to match the intensity of our hyperbaric therapies to the severity of the cases that we're working with. And instead of only 10 or 12 treatments total, which in many cases is what's done on some of these severe cases, these are chronic infections. It's much more likely that we're going to be using this for one month or two or three months or even five or six months at a time, knowing that this slow and steady increase in oxygen over a period of time is going to help this person's body manage, deal with, and fight these chronic anaerobic infections. There are certain common denominator that virtually all the diseases in this category share. Some of these include mitochondrial dysfunction, chronic inflammation, chronic hypoxia in the regions of the brain that are being affected, and chronic inflammation within the central nervous system itself. Now, what is it that we know about hyperbaric? We know that hyperbaric will deliver oxygen to all of the working cells and tissues in our body. And so if we have an area of chronic hypoxia, like we do in most neurodegenerative diseases, increasing the oxygen level will act as a fuel to help support that hypoxic cell and tissue. We also know that hyperbaric helps to reduce the cytokine response and reduce the inflammatory response systemically throughout the whole body. So if we have a category of disease that is consistently found to have higher levels of inflammation, we know that hyperbaric can help reduce that inflammatory response. We also know that hyperbaric delivers oxygen to the working cells to increase cellular energy production. So when we have mitochondrial dysfunction as a hallmark of a disease, we know that hyperbaric oxygen will help improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of the mitochondria's ability to produce cellular energy. We also know that hyperbaric oxygen is going to reduce oxidative stress in the area. A lot of this neurologic damage is done by oxidative stress. And hyperbaric reduces oxidative stress by increasing the body's own endogenous antioxidant system. And so after a series of treatments in a lot of these patients, we're going to see a reduction in oxidative stress. Even though we know that hyperbaric is somewhat of an oxidative therapy, we also know that the long-term benefit of hyperbaric is improved antioxidant systems inside their body. And lastly, we know that hyperbaric stimulates neuroplasticity. So in so many of these cases where there's neuron damage, we can see neuron healing, we could see neuron repair, we could also see growth factors and central nervous system stem cells moving into the area in order to repair and heal the neuron damage. We also know that hyperbaric will stimulate improved synapse connection with nearby neurons, improving the whole neuroplasticity of the brain itself. So with all these obvious mechanisms of action, hyperoxygenation for the hypoxic tissues, all the neuroplasticity, all the growth factors and stem cells, the reduction of inflammation and the reduction of oxidative stress, most certainly hyperbaric should be considered in almost every case with a chronic neurodegenerative disease. And so establishing that hyperbaric is appropriate in these cases, what might some different protocols look like? Well, in almost all neurological cases, with few exception, the majority of neurodegenerative cases in our offices would be treated at mild to moderate pressures. In other words, somewhere between a 1.3 atmospheric pressure to a 1.75 atmospheric pressure. Typically, neurodegenerative disease, we keep below 2 ATA. Why do we do that? For us, it's because most of the vasoconstriction that occurs because of hyperbaric oxygen happens in the central nervous system. In other words, the nervous system is protecting itself from excessively high levels of oxygen. So in my mind, I'm trying to deliver as much oxygen as we can for this patient to improve all of the systems that we talked about while also reducing the vasoconstriction and the protective mechanisms that the body has that may reduce some of the oxygen ultimately getting to the brain. In addition to that, one of the main reasons we have vasoconstriction inside the central nervous system is the body's attempt to reduce the risk of central nervous system oxygen toxicity. 
And while the central nervous system has a high metabolic activity rate, meaning it requires a lot of oxygen for function, it's also sensitive to getting too much oxygen. And so if we can find a protocol that delivers a large quantity of oxygen under the radar and it's keeping that patient safe while also making it an effective therapy for them, that's my go-to protocol in those cases. And so for patients with neurodegenerative disease where we're trying to treat the nervous system, knowing that the nervous system is the most sensitive, and in these cases, the central nervous system is damaged, we have to be very careful with how much oxygen we're delivering. And so our protocols would range from 1.3 to 1.75, the overwhelming majority getting somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 ATA. And a very standard program for us would be 60 to 90 minutes per session, four to six sessions per week for a minimum of three months. While autoimmune diseases are not technically on-label diseases that are treated with hyperbaric medicine, we do utilize hyperbaric oxygen off-label to help patients and support them through this autoimmune journey. When we're dealing with off-label indications in hyperbaric, we really have to look at the mechanisms of action of the therapy that we're utilizing. How does this device work and what will it do to somebody? And then the pathophysiology of this person's condition, does it make sense to apply this therapy with these mechanisms for this condition with this physiology? And so if we did that and we assessed autoimmunity as a whole, what would we find? We would find that there are certain cytokines or inflammatory markers that are consistently and chronically elevated in the overwhelming majority of these patients. And one of the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric is to reduce inflammation. We would also see that there's cell damage and tissue damage in a lot of these cases. As a result of the chronic inflammation and the immune system attacking those cells, those cells become damaged over time. We know that one of the mechanisms of action of hyperbaric is cellular repair and cellular regeneration. There are a variety of different growth factors and repair factors that are released inside of our body as a result of repetitive exposures to hyperbaric oxygen. Therefore, from a cell and tissue repair standpoint, hyperbaric would also be reasonable to use in those cases. And lastly, there is this imbalance inside of the immune system. There is an overactive portion of the immune system, or in some cases, there's an overactive portion of the immune system, but then other areas of the immune system have been chronically suppressed through other treatments. So one of the other mechanisms of action of hyperbaric is balancing and regulation of the immune system. And so again, hyperbaric used to help create that balance inside of our immune system would be appropriate and reasonable in these autoimmune cases. From a protocol standpoint, let's talk about inflammation first. We've already discussed that these patients have chronically elevated inflammatory cytokines inside of their body, and we know that hyperbaric can reduce them. We also know that a full range of pressures could have an effect on the inflammatory molecules inside of our body. So every pressure from 1.3 or a soft chamber all the way through two atmospheres and more all have an impact on reducing the inflammatory response inside of the body. Another thing we're starting to learn now is that certain pressures may impact certain cytokines more than others. In other words, lower pressure may have a greater effect on certain people. Higher pressure may have a certain effect on other people. We've done a video on some of the research that I've done in the past looking at these different cytokines. And if you happen to know which inflammatory cytokines are an issue for you, you could look back to some of those videos that we made and to see which category you may fall into Although I have to say, a lot more research needs to be done on this topic in order to really understand it, but that could be a beginning to understand which ranges either you or your patients may benefit from more. Either way, in all of my protocols, we always start at lower pressures because we really wanna do a gentle introduction to allow the body to adapt to these varying pressures of oxygen. So we always start at a 1.3 range and we slowly build patients through up to higher pressures if higher pressures are even needed. So we'll typically do three to five sessions at a 1.3, building into another three to five sessions at 1.5, building to another three to five sessions at 1.75. If we find a pressure that seems to irritate or aggravate some of the patient's symptoms, we'll drop back to the previous pressure and we'll stay there longer. Very rarely for an autoimmune case do I feel the need to even get to two atmospheres or above. Most of these patients seem to respond very favorably between 1.3 and 1.75. Almost exclusively, every one of these cases would typically do at least 40 hours of treatment. And we try to maintain four to six hours a week for eight to 10 weeks to get to that 40 hour. There will be reductions of inflammation in less than 40 hours. We typically see reductions of inflammation even somewhere between eight and 12 hours of treatment. But it's not until 20, 30, 40 hours that we really start to get the repair mechanisms 
the stem cell mobilization, the growth factors releasing. And so these longer protocols are not only geared to lowering their inflammation, they're also geared towards actually stimulating cellular and tissue repair so that some of the long-term consequences of this disease could start to become reversed. The target pressure for these protocols is really tissue specific. In other words, musculoskeletal issues like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, where there's a severe effect on the joints themselves, typically we would try to get to those higher pressures for those types of cases. Additionally, Crohn's and colitis, where this person has ulcers, essentially non-healing wounds inside of their intestines, they may also do better from a tissue repair standpoint at the higher pressures of 2, 2.2, 2.4, etc. Contrasting these musculoskeletal or intestinal conditions to something neurological like MS or ALS or even neurodegenerative disease, the majority of those people I would treat between 1.3 and 1.5. A lot of these neurological cases really do best at this lower to mid range of pressure rather than going to really high levels of pressure. So in my opinion, it's important to think of what tissue type we're trying to repair becomes the target pressure that we're gonna ultimately try to get to throughout that range and inside the protocol. Some patients that I thought could use higher pressure, they do so well at the mid ranges of pressure, we leave them alone. I don't push people harder than their body requires them to be pushed. Occasionally, I thought I was gonna keep somebody in the 1.3 to 1.5 range, but we slowly work them into 1.75 or 2.0 and they continue to flourish. These protocols are designed to be guidelines, not written in stone. It's your clinical decision-making. It's each person's case, each person's comorbidities and family history that have to help you steer the protocol into whatever the best solution for them is going to be. If you're looking for more information about autoimmune protocols, or if you're just looking for more information about hyperbaric oxygen, how it works, these mechanisms of action that I'm talking about, and or protocols for additional cases that you might be seeing inside your clinics, we did recently publish a textbook for hyperbaric medicine providers, and inside that book is all of this information. We'll include a link in the description below if you're interested in getting your hands on a copy of that book. Thanks again for your attention, and I'll see you on the next video.